Today, let's take a look at John. Chapter 12. Twelve through fifteen it says on the next day a vast or a large crowd, a whole bunch of folks uh, who had come to the the feast. When they heard, when they caught wind that Jesus was in town, they had been hearing about this man opening blind eyes, casting out demons, raising people from the dead. Everybody was wondering who is this guy and. You know exactly what what all was going on, but either way, they they hear this person that they've been hearing about is coming to town. So all the the vast crowds are coming out to see who this person was. And as he came in, they took branches. Everybody, wave your branch. Um, palm trees from from palm trees. And they went out to meet him, and they began to shout out loudly to rejoice. To celebrate uh, and saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, uh, the King uh, of Israel. Now this is foretold in Zechariah 9.9, which is on the front of your bulletin. Really nice little picture there of Jesus making his triumphal entry, uh, riding on a donkey. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed. That means he's been imparted with salvation, the opportunity to have eternal life. He's humble, mounted on a donkey, even as a colt. It says, your king is coming. The Amplified says that uncompromisingly just, having salvation and triumphant and victorious and patient. He's patient, meek, lowly, uh, riding in a donkey on a colt. Verse 14 of John 12 says that Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it. And as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming to you. Isn't that amazing how in Zechariah... <laughs> You know, many, 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 many moons before Jesus was ever even born. Uh, talk about this great day. It's going to happen. Uh, people were people probably didn't get it, but in reality, if they had thought about uh, you know uh, Zechariah and, and that prophecy, they would you know. And some of them probably did. Probably some said, "Oh my gosh, this this is what's going down right now." But the palm branch is, uh, what is the significance of palm branch? What is the palm branch? The, pro the palm branch is, means, it means to, to triumph, victory. Uh, it means to have peace and hope and salvation. So uh, what was going down here is, is that the, the donkey or the colt is symbolic of, of that's what kings rode, in, rode on, Okay. Uh, Saul, you remember he, I used to think a donkey, man. I mean, get you one of them big old Clydesdales or something, but whatever. The kings rode on donkeys, you know, or, or colts or whatever. And uh, when they became king, they would, uh, you know, when, when they, actually it was uh, the transition. When uh, David uh, turned over the crown to, pass the crown over to, um, to Solomon, he rode in on a mule or donkey as a celebration or announcement of there's been a change of kings we got a new king in town okay now uh, the jews had believed that jesus was a conquering king okay they had this idea in their head that that he was going to be a military commander he was going to come in and take out the romans i mean they hated the romans the romans were a sign of bondage and so uh, you know they they had this idea of of a conquering military, but Jesus didn't come that way. He first showed up as a suffering servant. Okay, he served and changed history like no other man. He ministered for three years and poured into his his disciples. He's passed on the baton. Now he's getting ready to go go to heaven. He's done suffered. 
Okay, he's going to the cross and he's going to suffer some more. But, but in three days, he's going to rise again. And now, he's going to come back as a conquering king. So there's a shift going on. Jesus at one time said, hey, it's not my time yet, okay? Quit, quit, you know, it's not quite time, but now's the time. Now's the moment. He suffered. Uh, whether the people realized it or not, whether they saw him as a suffering servant or a conquering king, whatever, some of them may not, some still may have thought, hey, you know, hey, celebrate and announce this military commander, he's going to, you know, oh, but some of them realize now that this, this shift was going to be that now Jesus was going to be resurrected from the dead, a suffering servant. He was going to heaven and he's going to be seated at his rightful place in the throne. And now he's going to be the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one sent by God, the, the gift, the good news, uh, which is what Easter is, a uh, salvation. So Jesus is making his triumphal entry and, you know, people are, are waving. The, the word Hosanna actually means... Uh, I beg you to save us. I beg you to deliver us. So these people, for whatever reason, they see this king coming. And so today, think about this king coming that he's not a suffering servant. He's been risen from the dead. He's seated at the right hand of God. He's our Messiah. He's our hope. He's our salvation. He's the one we put our faith into. He's our conquering king. And one day, we've crossed over with him. He's getting ready to cross over. We've crossed with Him, and we have salvation ready. And so today, back then, they were waving their palm branches, saying, uh, whatever, the, key, the conquering commander is here, or the, or the, the king, the Messiah, is here. Let's, let's beg you, save us, save us, deliver us. And they're all waving and watching as they celebrate and announce, the king is here, that time has come, the crossover is here. So today, as we go into worship, everybody grab your little palm and Let's get into a, an attitude of Palm Sunday that I don't know what the rest of the world is doing, but I know I'm going to heaven. I know I've got a king up in heaven, and I've got eternal life. And, and so today I celebrate knowing that, that now's the time, and, and, uh, and, and I can celebrate that my king's in heaven, and this is what Easter is about for all of us. So, so if you want to get bold and come up here and grab a Palm branch, if you want, Kathy won't mind you wave them or just kind of sit in there or just hang on, whatever you want to do today. Let's, let's, Hosanna, let's cry out, oh God, come save us, oh God, come help us. Let's celebrate our King today, amen? Amen. I'll be on the uh, radio station, WPIO, I've been asked to come and share uh, with them about uh, some of the things that I've gone through the last couple years and how the devil meant it for evil and how God has turned that to good. So uh, if you can tune in, that'd be great. If not, then please uh, pray for me. And uh, I believe God has used my experience to give me an anointing to reach out to people that are going through all kinds of anxiety disorders and depression and that. And so anyway, that's what's all that that's about. My message today will be life over the target, learning to to be aware of, of who we are and what, who the devil is. So that in mind, I'm going to be teaching on that. So Wednesday is going to be how we can practice that follow-up from what I'm talking on today and go to war. And uh, if we're over the target, then uh, we need to realize that even more so, we need to really, really pray. So let's, uh, uh, we're going to make it a day of prayer and fasting. Uh, and Damien's going to have a nice... Spaghetti dinner are ready for us, him and Chuck and the boys and all them uh, over in the gathering place. So we're going to start a little early this time at 6.30. We're going to do one hour and then we're going to go pray, go to war and fast during the day. So let's, uh, let's get focused and ready to go to war that day. Invite some family and friends and people that can come join us that you know are prayer warriors. Every little bit counts. Amen. So that's Wednesday at 6.30. And also now, uh, I don't know if you are aware of how we are structured here in our Liberty Lodge Ministries, but basically we have four parts to our program. We have a six-month orientation, entry-level kind of program where we basically help men get off drugs and alcohol, teach them how to make sure they're saved, teach them how to hear God, how to journal and listen to God and do those basics and 
Then the next two months to six months is what we call transition. That gives men opportunity to kind of start practicing what they've learned and get some uh, life skills, how to use a phone, how to get a car, how to pay off bills and ch catch up on all those things. And then we've got a aftercare program for guys that have been here over a year, which is minimal accountability. But uh, then we have our fourth part is uh, training aspect of it. We have what we call servant leadership training here, which after a man graduates, if they feel a call and we feel the same, and then they come and serve the ministry for another six months. And then we have uh, staff training is, is another thing where after that they go on and continue to train. And, and the other part of that last phase is internships, which we've had available for a long time, but we've not ever uh, I don't think we've had anybody, anybody intern yet. So, But we have our first intern, everybody. Come on, Rudy. Come on up here, buddy. Let's give Rudy a hand. We're always looking. For, we're like the Marine Corps around here. We're always looking for a few good men. And uh, for whatever reason, we believe that God has sent us this. Lord knows we need the help. And I believe it's providential. I believe it's a divine appointment. I believe there's no strange coincidence. You're here. I believe God sent you here uh, for you to help us. And then maybe we can help you at the same time. And so part of what we do here, I was telling Lance this morning, part of what we do here as spiritual fathers is to cultivate people. Cultivate means to take something that is raw and, uh, you know, un, unproven and cultivate it. That means to maximize the potential and bring out the best in it. Get rid of the rocks, the things that are unproductive, the weeds, the strongholds, the things that interfere. Bring in, in the new things and the things that will enhance spiritual progress. So that's, that's, that's part of what we are. We're here to cultivate people, to bring things out. So hopefully uh, we can uh, do that some with you. So Rudy, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us who you are, where you're from, that kind of thing. Okay. Good morning, sir. Maryland. Um, I was addicted to drugs and alcohol at an early age, and uh, it took a long time for me to just get things right. And uh, a few years ago, I ended up at Dunklin, and I stayed the uh, di and did the ten-month program, and then I, I stayed another year and did their SLT program, and. Uh, as well as getting off the drugs and the alcohol, I um, formed a relationship with the Lord. So I realized that that was what I was needing for a very, very long time. Um, I spent a lot of time in addiction and uh, just couldn't seem to get right. And so in forming that relationship with the Lord, I, um, I learned some things, uh, what Pastor was talking about, uh, journaling, uh, just digging into that relationship with Jesus and uh, finding out who he is and how he's working in my life and how he's going to continue to work in my life. And so I felt a calling uh, after the SLT program at Dunklin um, to uh, continue. And I, I, I prayed about it and, and I asked my uh, spiritual leaders about it, spiritual authority and prayed about it some more and I asked some more questions and I uh, kept my hands out of it and the Lord was telling me just uh, just be willing to go uh, where I tell you to go and uh, I'll show you the rest and that's what I did and that's what I'm here doing uh, learning to uh, answer God's call and be the person that the Lord needs me to be and um, it's a process so uh, I'm just uh, looking at it as uh, another part of being a servant. But it's m much more to others, but I'm willing to be a servant today. So thanks for having me. Amen. All right, well, welcome to our family, Brother, brother Rudy. And also, keep in mind, we had preached a few weeks ago on the importance of what it means to be blessed out. Well, this is what's so cool about Rudy. He was blessed out. You know, he left under authority, with authority, and had heard God and prayed and, and uh, heard God. So based upon that, having finished SLT, he was, they said, hey, this is a great thing. You're going to a good place. We believe this is of God, so we're going to bless you and send you down there. So 
Uh, he's taken everything from Dunklin and is going to bring that to us. And we, so we received that blessing. We received that blessing, and, and now we've got a responsibility to help cultivate him. So everybody behind uh, Rudy here and be praying for him. And let's uh, get excited about God taking us to a new level. Amen. Next week, Easter, my message, I believe, is going to be entitled, No Cross, No Crown. The great crossover. Why Christ had to die. What his significance was and what that significant means to us. But aren't you glad he crossed over? <laughs> no death, no resurrection. The resurrection is absolute proof that everything we do was real and genuine. If there had been no resurrection, then we would have no hope, no promise of eternal life. We'd be dead in our trespasses and sins and wouldn't have any clue about what's going on after we die. But we believe that the, the resurrection uh, was absolute proof. Uh, that same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead when He crossed over, we crossed five, and we have that same power living inside of us through the Holy Spirit, the Helper, who is helping us live this Christian life and do for us what we can't do for Himself. So, we got a lot of hope, don't we? we got a future, a divine destiny. Life is but a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. The average man lives to be 76 years old, and then he dies and he goes to heaven or hell. Both places are going to be forever, eternal. That means forever and forever and forever and forever. For us that are Christians, we know that one day, when it's all said and done, we're going to graduate. Our real home will be in heaven where we'll share eternity as the eternal bride or eternal companion of Jesus, being sent out throughout eternity on missions and assignments, all kinds of glorious things. We're definitely not going to be bored in heaven. Uh, it's going to be awesome. We won't have mosquitoes. We won't have roots in the yard. We won't have that addiction stuff hanging all over us. Our physical bodies will have new bodies, brand new, 32 inch waist and you know, we're going to be in paradise and in utter 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 paradise, utter bliss, supreme bliss. The word how blessed means to be eternally means to bliss. Uh, I don't know what bliss exactly means, but it sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Uh, so we got a lot to look forward to, amen. In the meantime, we got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of things to think about. But the way we survive, the, like the men in Hebrews 11 survived by faith, they believed that there was a city, uh, that this wasn't their home, that their real home was in heaven. They fixed their eyes on the an architect, <laughs> you know, whose builder was making a home for us in heaven, and they had a home, and we had an architect or builder. Not, in, you know, in, made with human hands, but made in heaven and eternal, and it's waiting for us. The Bible says, uh, therefore the outer man decays, but the inner man is being renewed day by day, being prepared for our heavenly home. So, let's start focusing on the positive, everybody, okay? You know, we got a lot of craziness going on out there. And, uh, you know, you can knock me down. Uh, put me in handcuffs, take my body and burn me to the stake, but... Uh, so what? I'm, I'm going to go to heaven. And uh, you know what I'm saying? The world can throw everything they got at us. The devil can throw everything at but uh, Jesus has already overcome. He's already conquered. He's, uh, it's been done. And it's been given to us. But we do have a war to face. Things to think about. Revelation 2.7 is our scripture we've been going over and over. What it, uh, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him listen to what the Spirit is saying and obey what the Spirit's saying. So today, not last week, not next week, but today, what do I believe is the Spirit saying? I've spent time in, in His presence lifting, and I believe God has shown me some, some really good revelation. I hope it makes sense to you. It made sense to me, but if I'm not preaching to you, I'm preaching to somebody that's listening. If, if nothing else, the devil needs to hear this one today. Amen? And so uh, let's turn to Isaiah Fifty-four. This is a scripture that 
God gave me years ago when we had a mess. Uh, pretty much a mess, wasn't it, Lloyd? <laughs> $400 in the bank, okay? <laughs> the building outside here was painted like a penitentiary. It was brown, and the, the yards were completely dirt, full of weeds. Peter Lord, everybody was wanting us to give the church away, even... Uh, people that are highly respected that God had another plan. I remember Peter Lord says, well, you, you don't have a lot of control exactly over what goes on, on the inside, but you can have start with some control on the outside. So you do got men, so paint the building, man. It looks like, you know, it looks like a penitentiary. Put some palm trees out here and, uh, you know, fix some sprinklers, get some grass growing in. We started there. How I many you know the outside's a reflection of what's going on, on the inside? You tell a lot of man about uh, if you look inside his trunk or go in his bedroom, you can find a lot of, about a man. So we may not be big, you know, in numbers, but we're big in heart. And uh, we may not be making headlines here on earth, like some churches around here, but we're making headlines in heaven. Okay, heaven has taken notice. We've been recognized. There were some guys in the Bible and Acts that tried to cast out these demons, and they didn't. Uh, they apparently weren't clean, had weren't squeaky clean. And anyway, the devil just as they were trying to cast them out, the devil just looked at him and says, says, "Who are you? <laughs> who are you? We know who Paul is." We know who Jesus is, uh, but who are you? And there was no authority there. There had been, there was no recognition from heaven on these men that were casting out demons. There was no authority there, and it came back on them. But when we have authority given to us by God, and, and we're acting on that authority, we're, we're somebody, okay? And uh, uh, you know, uh, heaven takes notice. So let me ask you today: You know, does the devil know who you are? <laughs> if he doesn't know who you are yet, you, you ain't doing much. Let me just say that. Okay. Uh, you know, today we're going to talk about life over the target. Uh, like I say, the, the community might not know a lot about us, what we do, but I guarantee you heaven knows what we're doing, and we've take, been taking notice. We've been recognized, and and uh, you know we're we've been recognized as 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 a, a place of God's anointing, and we continue to have gone from the mess to the message and, and developed and moved along over the years. The scripture that I keep bringing out all the time is is to help us see where we've come from. You know the question is who are we? We always have to ask ourselves who are we? That means individually too. Who are you? Uh, where are you going? Uh, long term, short term, why are you, what are you doing today? You know, where you been? Don't never forget that. Uh, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. And, and this is where I'm going. But today, where am I at in that? And we need to examine and look at where we are in our journey to find out, you know, are we behind? Are we ahead? And, and so as a ministry, this is kind of a state of union, a tailboard, whatever. Isaiah 54 says, enlarge, expand, grow the place of your tent. This is where this is the place where our tent is right here. This is the city of refuge. Uh, we're called to work primarily with those in addictions, life controlling issues, life controlling problems. How many know we all got those? Uh, stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs. Pegs are leadership. Uh, stretch out means to with your foundation go wider and go deeper. How many know the higher you go, the more wider you have to go in your foundation and the deeper? If you don't, then as you grow, you'll topple. You fall. So that's why we prune. You cut down to make the root system grow out. Every now and then God does a pruning here. <laughs> okay? Gets rid of some stuff. To, to, but really it's always to, you know, make us grow deeper. So, for you might spread out abroad to the right and to the left. Now it says you will. So if you enlarge the place of your tent, you stretch out, you raise up, you cultivate, raise up leadership, 
the place of your tent, cultivate it, fix it, fix the yard up. Uh, you, know, you know, bring some quality, not not quantity, but bring some quality. Don't get focus on being bigger, but focus on being better. And you will, as a result, the byproduct of faithfulness, you will spread abroad to the right and to the left. And your descendants will possess nations and will resettle the desolate cities. This was a city of refuge, but it was a desolate one. God, over time, has continued to settle down, settle down, and settle down. He's continued to work on me and sift me and throw me up down and deal with me. You know, he's worked on raising up leadership. We've, uh, you know, everything you see, all these men right here. You know, you guys that are helping me over there pick weeds and paint and do all these different things. All that, you're doing that for, for the next generation. Okay, you're doing that for, for everybody. There were men just like you 20 years ago when I got here. <laughs> Matter of fact, they were in here. We shut the church down for, what, about six months. Just, and the men worked in here to have what we have today. This is all a byproduct of men giving their lives, giving back, and everything you see from the bathrooms. You just look around. It's amazing. God has continued to settle that and span. So part of our expanding is bringing Rudy on and trying to bring a better quality. So we've took some hits, we've gone through some things, but we've wisely slowed down, backed away, uh, restructured, reorganizing, and we're, you know, doing, we're doing some changes and, uh, you know, trying to, to get that better. But, but we're going to a new level. I got the best staff we've ever had. At, I call it the dream team. You know, we got money in the bank. We got men coming in. Everything's paid for. Can you believe that? We're sitting on probably, you know, about two, two over $2 million worth of properties. Investment. It's all paid for. All by your tithes and offerings. You've done that. And this is where we are. So we're going to a new level. Uh, and we're over the target. I want to talk today about life over the target. <laughs> Paul was telling Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12. We don't have a PowerPoint today, so this is a good time just to listen. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.12 says that, uh, but all that desire to live godly might be persecuted. All, black, white, male, female, everybody, all that's born again, all people that are trying to live a godly life, <laughs> will have persecution, suffering. There's a wrong doctrine out there. It's not sound doctrine about this whole Jesus thing. Oh, come to Jesus just as you are. Give your heart to Jesus. It's free. It's all grace. And that's true. But how I many you know salvation is a gift? It's free, but it costs you a life. Cost your life to follow Jesus. <laughs> John the Baptist came preaching, crying out in the wilderness, The kingdom of heaven is here. You can have eternal life. Here it is. Come in, cross over, join in the kingdom. You can enter right now here on this earth and be guaranteed eternal life. And they cut his head off. Kingdom of heaven has suffered violence ever since, and violent men have to take it by force. That means use whatever means are necessary to enter into it. Because the devil's sure trying to keep you out of it. Jesus was a man. Psalms fifty-three or Isaiah fifty-three three says that he was a, he was a man of many many sorrows. Acquainted. That means he was fully aware of grief. They spit on him. They accused him of being a drunk. He came too, also preaching. Heaven, kingdom of heaven is now here. John passed the torch. Jesus says, it's "Here, enter in. You can have eternal life." And you know, even the thieves on the cross mocked him up till the end. And they nailed Jesus to the cross. So if you've entered into that kingdom, and, and, uh, then you're going to suffer violence too. You're going to come up against that, and they're going to persecute you. Not if. So opposition is going to come. You're going to suffer. There's a false doctrine out there. Oh, everything just come and, you know, be happy. And then all of a sudden, uh, persecution hits and things don't go your way because the devil just realized, that, you know, you walk this... Come to Jesus. Raise your hand and you can have eternal life. And, and, uh, but they don't tell you what, what, what to expect when you come back. And their goal is to get 
numbers here on the Sunday school board. Okay, we got three saved on Sunday. We had attendance. We had so much money sitting in the Baptist churches. And, you know, but they don't tell you what to expect. They don't paint a true, they don't read the fine line that if you're going to, if you're going to become a king, you know, you're going to be, you're going to suffer. <laughs> you're going to have to die. If you desire to live godly, and you really are trying to do this thing, and you're up in the narrow gate, and you're serious, and you know, you just became a threat from the devil. You just jumped sides. You were running with the devil. <laughs> he had his way with you. You pledged your allegiance to him. Now you just pledge your allegiance to, to, to G. You think the devil's who's had you for 35 years and addiction and all these things just going to sit by and watch you watch it go down? No. You enter the kingdom, you just joined, you just became a threat. You just got a bullseye given to you. You know? Uh, it's two deers out in the woods one day during deer season. They were hiding and ducking, and uh, the one deer had a bullseye birthmark <laughs> right on his. And the other deer looked at it and said, That's a bummer of a birthmark. You know, you're a target now. And you know, they see right where to shoot. So, whether you realize or not, you've, been get, you've got a birthmark. You've been stamped. You've been recognized child of God. Your, your name's been recorded in heaven. It's known in heaven. And all, all, all the supernatural realm recognizes that thing that happened. That's why heaven says rejoice, jump up, shout for joy. When one sinner, when one sinner gets saved, everybody rejoices. But all hell gets aggravated. All hell gets furious. You know, and they're not going to just, you know, so, uh, you know, Paul Harvey, you got a, uh, I got a thing on Facebook today, maybe look it up when you get home. He wrote, he had a sermon or something about if I was the devil, if I were the devil, what would I do? First Peter 5 8 says, Your adversary, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Everybody know what it means to be sober? Pay attention, have your faculty, don't be all stuck on stupid. Be sober, be alert, be vigilant, pay attention to what's going on around you. Don't be a fool. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around <laughs> like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The word devour means to swallow with one big gulp. The devil loves to nitpick. Yeah, I smoke some cigarettes, so you can drink here. You know, you know, when you get serious with God and you start, you know, cigarettes ain't an issue anymore. Alcohol, you know, you've been past all that. Okay, so the devil knows that. He can't, he's not going to, you're not going to get me to smoke crack today, all right? You're not going to get me to go watch up dirty movies. And do, I mean, I'm way past all that. Not, not that I'm above it. I'm just saying I've entered into this place of, of understanding and awareness of who I am and, and my responsibility. But the devil studies you, man. I've seen that devil walking up this side block. I've seen him sitting on those benches over there. Studying the men in Liberty Lodge uh, that that uh, were stole from him. How can I get that guy out of Liberty Lodge? He studies each one of you. He watches. He sees where your Achilles heel. He watch. He sees where you're vulnerable. He says, "I know what I'll do. I'll give him a twenty dollar an hour job." Well, I know what I'll do. I'll send him a pretty devil dressed <laughs> like a like an angel in sheep's clothing, and that'll take him out. Or I'll get him thinking, oh, my family's out there. Oh, you know, i got to get them out of here. i got to need to go take care of Well, you know, you weren't thinking about your family when you was out there doing your drugs. And I go, why, you know, best thing you can do is, is to stay here and get fixed. But the devil would love to snatch you out of here. So anyway, he studies this church. He watches. Okay. He sees we've resettled the desolate. He sees what we've done. He sees who we are. He sees that we're going to a new level. But how many know with a new level is a new devil? So he can't, he's got to study you. He's got to watch you. This is why it says to put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against all, 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 stand firm against all the schemes. What's that word, Lance? He did study uh, wiles, uh, tricks, bait, or strategies. The devil's trying to find a strategy, okay? Okay. And our strategy has to outdo his strategy. That's where warfare comes in. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's, uh, it's, it's against principalities. I, my struggle right now is not with the de de democratic thing. I mean, that's uh, who I am. That's, you know, it, our struggle is not with the far left. Our struggle is not with the price of gas. Our struggle is you know, not with, uh, you know, uh, these things. You know, my, my real struggles, yes, I've got struggles. You know, we all have relational struggles. We all have 
struggles. You know, we all have things, but it's, it's, not, a, it's not a fleshly thing. It is. We have to address the fleshly natural realm, but it's a supernatural problem. There's an antichrist spirit that is going on. And our war, you know, is, is not a, you know, it's not a natural war, flesh. It's against spiritual, spiritual forces. So spiritual forces have to be taken down in spiritual ways. We don't need to work harder. We need to learn to work smarter. Zechariah 4, 6 says, It's not by power, nor by might or intellect, but by my spirit. The spirit is how we dismantle that spirit of Antichrist. Uh, on our knees. You want to wage war? Your problem's not really your husband. I mean, it might be, or your wife, or your job, or your boss, or your roommate, or, you know, whatever. But the real problem is, yes, you've got to deal with those things. But in, in reality, there's, there's always a devil working. He's always studying. He's always, how can I, if I was a devil, he said, how can I get Pastor Dave out? We tried this, we tried this, we tried this, we tried this. I knocked him down here, but he got back up, dadgummit. Uh, I tried this, he knocked him down there, but he got back up. You know, that's grace, okay? That's God's favor. That's His anointing. Okay. How I many you know if you if you what's what's the goal when you go bowling? You know you got to hit the head pin, right? You, you know if you hit the head pin just right, then you knock all of them down. Sometimes you even say if you curve it in and come out with strategy <laughs> and hit it, that's actually the best way to, to do that, not just straight head on. So the devil's, you know. You know, if he's, he's not going to come straight on at me. He's going to come from a different angle. He, he knows if he gets me, he gets the rest of them to fall. But if he can't get me, who's he going to get? He's going to go after Pastor Lance. And if he can't get Pastor Lance, then he's going to work his way down. He'll go after the house man. Wow, I've got one house man watching 20 guys over there. Let me see if I can get him all, you know. Then he's going to be looking at Jackie. Okay, well, how do you know? How can I mess up that war room? That that war room over there. Boy, they're doing some damage. They're killing me on Mondays. They go to war. How can I shut that thing down? You know, well, I'll try to get rid of Jackie and take her out, and or I'll cause division or offense or uh, you know come against authority or you know or let me tell you, the devil's always studying. He's always watching. You know, and and, and he'll he'll do what everything he can. So you know, it's not if it's it's when. If I were the devil and I wanted to take it out, I, I would go after leadership and work my down. The, the devil's goal is to divide and conquer. That's the way he works. Okay? He'll, he'll try to set odds over here. He'll try to get Pastor Dave over here and Lance over here. He'll try to get Damien over here and Lance over here. He'll try to get you and your roommate divided, isolate, get you away from a fence. That's why restoration and forgiveness and healing in relationships is so important. Because the devil loves to get you offended and get you mad. Oh, I'll just go to another church. I'll go to another church. And, okay, you go to another church, same thing's going to happen there. <laughs> you know? So we got to pay attention, okay? <clears throat> this is not no... We're in a war. <clears throat> and if we're in a war, we gotta, we got to get warfare ready. we got to <clears throat> pay attention to what's going on around us. Interesting word came this Micah 2.13. <coughs> Micah 2.13. Uh, um, the breaker goes up before them and they break out. Who is them and who is they? That's us. The breaker, which is... King Jesus goes ahead of us. He's always going out there for us. He he's, leads the way. He goes up before us, and, and they will break out. That means when He goes up and breaks up the way, then we'll break out. As He breaks up, we break out. Fruitfulness, productivity, harvest, exciting things. So their king goes on before them, and the Lord, the Lord is at their head. Uh, I was given this word and I started thinking about this and, and the Lord spoke to me and He showed me in the Spirit that there's, uh, there's a gate. You know, the Bible talks about a narrow gate and only few are able to get in there because the price escalates. You get saved, we enter into the narrow gate and, and, it, and it gets smaller and smaller. It gets more narrow and narrow. Uh, okay? I come to Jesus, enter the gate, everybody hoops and hollows, I'm excited, but I don't realize that, that now I've got to keep going into the narrow gate. 
Uh, it's an easy gate over there because you don't have to give up nothing. You can smoke, drink, have sex while you're married, have sex, you know, and, and do all this stuff. That's, that's the wide gate, and there are many are who are entering into it, and there's preachers saying, hey, come into this gate. And it's the wrong gate. It's wrong doctrine. It's not sound doctrine. Come in here, you know, and it's, you got to pay attention. You've got to discern what's going on today. That, that gate's being offered out there today. And if you're not paying attention, you know, let me tell you, Jesus didn't wear a Rolex watch and, you know, drive a Bentley and fly around in a $7 million jet, you know, and he didn't work, you know, he, I mean, and I'm not saying, I'm not against f- things, okay, but there's so much focus on prosperity doctrine and all these different things, and, you know, Jesus, Jesus never even had a home, never had a car, he never got married, it wasn't, a, it was, a, he was sor- a man of sorrows, his life was sorrow, one sorrow after another, after another, after another, acquainted with grief, he shut down one thing and opened up here. He's talking about dying, going to, to have to suffer the cross, and next thing you know, his disciples are fighting in like a bar fight over who's the greatest. Insane stuff. I mean, think about it. He's on the cross. Everybody's split, except his mom and John and two thieves. Whole life spent, and here he is nailed to it. Can you imagine? You know, oh, come to Jesus and prosper, you know. That's, that's a false doctrine. Okay? There's nothing wrong with prosperity, but real prosperity happens in our heart. But the Lord showed me that there's a, you know, as you go into the narrow gate, you've got to start giving things up. As the breaker goes ahead and he breaks things up, you know, uh, he enters the gate for you. He goes ahead of you. He breaks it up, but there's, it costs you, okay, as you go further. But the Lord showed me this gate that, that we've entered into as a, as a ministry, and he, he showed me an adder in the hole. Anybody know what an adder is? An adder is a bad dude snake. Very, uh, you know, they say adder in the hole, adder in the hole. That means, you know, deadly poison, deadly, deadly ahead, you know. And uh, I don't know the spiritual significance, but he, he showed me a spirit that uh, has constantly hindered us and impeded us, been a stumbling block as a church over the years. It's started probably back, who knows, and the Lord showed me these different things, times, that it's happened. And it's, it's an antichrist spirit is what it is. And it's always around. It's never going to go fully. But it is a spirit that, that has been in our way, that God has been exposing it. He's bringing it out of the open. All that prayer that you ladies are doing or fishing, it's, it's flushing it up to the surface. The fasting that, that I've been doing and the extra fasting and all is, has been flushing it up. You know, you, you, know, you want to you wanna, you wanna, you wanna flush things up, go f- start fasting. Day of your fast, you will find your desire. You know, some things don't come out but by prayer and fasting. So, you know, when you, uh, when you start fasting, you're going to flush things up. And so, uh, we've, been, we've been flushing that baby up. It ain't fun. It ain't easy. We've gone through some wars, but, we've, but we're catching it. We're learning to recognize it. And today, this is what I'm telling you. We're, we're going to a new level. Corporately and individually. I believe God has taken us to a place we've never been before. But doggone, you better pay attention because a new level means a, do, a new devil. doesn't mean you need to be afraid of the devil or intimidated of the devil, but you better pay attention to him. Even angels didn't dispute. Even angels didn't get into it with other demons. There were no match. We're no match for the devil. But so we let God fight our battle. This is, this is how we fight our battles. Amen? Okay? We wave our palms. We get into the Word. We fight. We get engaged. You know, not by power, but by my, by my spirit. We, we start, don't work harder. We start working smarter. We were in times where you've got to start working smarter, not harder. You've got to spend more time on your knees. You want power, you want boldness, you want authority, you want things to change. Prayer changes things. Hello. You know, get on your knees, pray. You want change? Pray. You're concerned about your relationship with your wife and husband? Then do something about it. Go go get get on your knee. Go out fast. Pray. You know, you're sick. You got a problem. I, I, I you know, go to the beg. Come up here and say, Lord, <laughs> you're my dad, you're my father, this is your job. This is killing me. Help me, help me. Cry out, plead, get desperate. Do whatever you need to do. Throw a temper tantrum. Whatever you need to do. Stir it up, wake it, go to war. Whatever it takes, enter in. Take what belongs for you. Quit being ripped off by the devil. You've got a divine destiny, and you need to jump in there and grab it. Go for it. 
You got to seize it. You got to possess it. You know, uh, the devil wants to seize on you. He wants to pounce on you. He wants to swallow you with one big gulp. And so you need to turn around and, you know, you need to go to war with him and get out, do his strategy by going to God and say, Give me strategy. I started thinking that, you know, I've had a physical thing for 30, 40 some years, a physical infirmity. You know, it's not a sin, it's just an infirmity thing. And, you know, it's, it's my thorn in the flesh. And, you know, and uh, I started realizing, you know, I've been fighting that thing and mad, angry, upset, you know, but the Lord says, well, you know, uh, let me give you a strategy. Come to me. You know, I know how to dismantle that thing. It ain't gone nowhere. You've been praying. So, so come to me. Work in the spirit. Get smarter. Fast. Pray. Go after that. If you want to make a difference. Some things don't come out except by prayer and fasting. That means some things aren't going to move unless you dive in. They're strongholds. They've been there forever. They're deeply ingrained habit patterns that control your life. You've got to go down and get them weeds, them roots, and get all of them. Because a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. You've got to get it all. It's like cancer. So anyway, the Lord showed me this Jezebel kind of spirit. That's what it is. Jezebel is, is always out to castrate. That's what a Jezebel spirit does. It castrates authority. It's not a man thing. That Jezebel spirit is out to take Jackie Higgins' authority. It's out to take Jamie Milan's authority. And you know, that's what it wants. It wants to castrate you. It wants to intimidate you. It wants to knock you down and inval uh, cause you to be uh, inoperative and dis disarm you and dismantle you. Well, that's what it wants to do to you, but you got to, you know, we got to dismantle this thing. If nothing, we got to be aware of it. Okay, we got to go to, we got to go to war against this thing. And so there's this adder in the hole. There's this antichrist Jezebel spirit that's, that's been working in, and, uh, you know, we're, we're on to it. I've been on to it and aware of it for long, but it's becoming more and more clear now that God has a destiny. He has a new level for me. And He wants to not just mess with He wants to kill me. I got a hit on my life. God showed me that two years ago. There was a hit on my life. And God hid me. Like He hid Moses in a basket. That's why I left here. God hid me to protect me. I never told anybody this. But the devil had a hit on my life. I stepped away. Lance and them took over and allowed me the time to, to hide in the sense of, of warfare. I went, into a, uh, I went into the adder's hole, okay? I went to a place I've never been before. I went to a place I never knew existed. The hole. And there God brought me to, to my knees, to the end of myself, and broke. And today I've, there's been a, a new release. I, I came out of there, you know, on the cross, in the tomb for a month. God told me that, he, that I was going to go into the tomb and, and die on the cross, but there was going to be a resurrection. It was coming. And when this whole thing was over, God was going to resurrect me and take me to a whole new level of power. And, you know, and I went through literal hell. I went literally into hell in the spiritual realm. I literally, in the spiritual realm, went into hell and had to do war over this thing. And God was there at the valley of the shadow of death, the darkest point of my life. God showed up. The devil thought he had me doubt, but resurrection day came. And same with you, God has a hit on your life. He hates you. He wants to take you out. But God has a divine destiny. But you're going to have to fight for it. He wants to take it. And we're in those kinds of times. You know, we're going to have to rely on supernatural sustenance. We may have to rely on a raven to come feed us. We may have to rely on water coming out of a rock. We may have to go fishing and gut them and find some money inside a fish. I don't know. But God will take care of us. But we better wake up and pay attention. I say all this today not to make you afraid, but to make you aware of who we are. This is a backhanded compliment. If you're over the target, you can expect a lot of shrapnel over your head. If you're not experiencing opposition and persecution, per, what's that word? Persecution, and, and, and you don't have some bullets and things, then probably you're not even up engaged whatsoever. You're, you know, you're probably back here in the big gate. You're going through the big gate, you're no threat to the devil. <laughs> oh, you know, blah, 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 greasy gray, sloppy. Oh, 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 and that's that. But if you go into the narrow gate, man, <laughs> you better put your boxing gloves on. When I get to heaven, I want to look like I want to have some br uh, bruises on my eye and some black eyes, and I want to look like I've been in an all-out scrap. And I've been in an all-out scrap. And we're and if you desire to live godly, you're going to be in a scrap. You're going to have to fight, but give yourself a compliment. 
except for sin. If you're, you know, godly people that are living godly, serve for persecution, but opposition will be turned to opportunity, and God can use that to change your life and turn you into a Holy Ghost wrecking machine and take you to a, a new level you've never been before. So, it is what it is. So we've got to go to war. We've got to dismantle. We're restructuring right now. We're, we're, we're on to them. We're having to take some strategy now and restructure, and we've got to reposition now. We're not quite invented it, but we know we've made some changes here. And uh, we're going places. But our strategy is going to have to outdo his strategies. We're going to have to up our level of prayer. We're going to fast and pray. That's what we're going to do Wednesday. We're going to carry out and talk. We're not going to talk about it. We're going to get down and do some praying. God told me a while back to every now and then throw in an extra day of fasting. And I'm like, well, like after a year of telling me that, I'm like, uh, what's keeping you, son? You know, fasting's no fun. Just do it. And so pick a day and go for it. Well, what is it? I forget it. Just do it. You know, Lord don't care what day. You know, he don't care about all that stuff. He just wants you to do something. Get aggressive. Get assertive. Get some backbone. Quit talking about wishbone. Amen? All right. Let me go to... The Lord gave me this scripture. This is weird. I don't even know what I'm going to do here. 1 Timothy 2.8 Therefore, <clears throat> Paul, is, Paul is talking to Timothy about church life. He's... That's... Timothy's his grasshopper. He's trying to cultivate him. He's trying to develop him. Timothy's afraid. He's intimidated. He's all the stuff we all go through. And Paul's taking him under his wing and telling him how to do things more accurately. Hey, son, I made a lot of mistakes and don't do that, but this is what you do. And, and uh, you know, we can learn a lot from other people's mistakes. But he said, uh, one thing, Timothy, out, out of all the other things, stir up the gift of God. Don't be intimidated. You know, all that stuff. But another thing, by the way, here's another thing. Therefore, I want, desire, that the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Amplified says, I desire. Uh, it's not a wish. He said, I'm not wishing you do this. I'm commanding you. He says, this, is, this, was, this should be what should be done. This should be a common practice everywhere. Paul tells Timothy, in every church you visit, this should be something that should be done. I never really have seen this before. It says that the men, the word is andros, and it refers, it's referring specifically to males, men. I mean, men are, have a delegated authority. Uh, they talk about men being the priests of the, home, the homes and all, you know, and, and that's true. That, that's biblical. That, that is the truth. Men are, are, are supposed to be Jesus was under the authority of God. Mankind, man is supposed to be under the authority of Jesus and the wife under the man. Not because one of them is better, but he's got to have some kind of structure. Some kind of created order of chain of command. Just like in the military. Everybody's got to have a, a rank. Uh, but men have been given the right to be priests of their home. That means they have a delegated authority uh, you know, over their kids and their wife and their family. James 5.16 says... Um, that the prayers of a righteous man accomplish much. Righteous men who are in right standing with God have a delegated authority. If you're saved, you have righteous, you have authority, not just pastor, preacher, but every man of God has a certain authority that's been given to him to use. It, it carries a punch. The Amplified says it makes tremendous power available and it's dynamic and it's working. That means when a righteous man hits his knee, man, you better run. You're finna to make some stuff happen. So men are called to be the rightful pre, but they violated that because they've been castrated for whatever reason. The devil's taken them out, and, and the problem in the home and the family today is there's no man of God. They're, they're either not available or not there, or they laid up on the couch, you know, doing all this stuff and everything but what they need to be doing. And that's part of the, the, the devil loves to divide and conquer. Okay? So men need to get up off the couch, get off your butt. We need to stand up and take our rightful position. And what this means is that the, prayer, the, the prayers of a, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, I desire that, that men lift up holy hands. Whether these hands are perfect or blameless, uh, my hands are holy. Okay, in, in, positionally. I may have some dirt on them, I may need to scrub them up, but positionally I have holy hands. Okay. And we lift up holy hands without wrath, without resentment, without anger. 
Men today can't lift up holy hands because they've got so many resentments. They've got so much anger. They, they've got stuff they've not dealt with. And they're making it about everybody else. And then we're going through all this stuff. And, you know, and, and they're, not, they're not dealing with our stuff like we need to. And so we don't have to be perfect or blameless, but we have to have our hearts ready. That means we have to, okay, my hands, let me scrub them up real good. Okay, they're holy, but I got some stuff that's making them, okay, let's scrub them up. Let's, and let's get into the, to the posture in the Old Testament was for a righteous man to, uh, when he prayed, uh, this is what he did. He went, he, he looked straight into heaven. His face was bent. He saw Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. Having passed the torch over to the disciples and mankind and offered the cross over the way of salvation, and they see him interceding for that them. I've got Jesus interceding for me right now at the throne of God, for me right now, and for you. That's what he does. He's a, he's a perpetual priest, 24 7, praying for us. So they would look at that authority and say, God has given me this authority. Wow, I've got these hands that are holy. And they would posture themselves. Uh, and position themselves based upon that understanding of that fact. And it says they would lift up holy hands, palms open, uh, and stretch out hands, uh, not because of who they are, but because of whose they are. And they would exercise their rightly priest and take authority, and they would pray over things. So this sounds kind of weird, but I want every man in here today... If you would, if you don't want to participate. But I'd like all the men in the church to come up here right now. Okay? You ladies. All you men, I want you to posture yourself, position yourselves. Uh, everybody look at your hands and say, these are holy hands. I'm a priest of the Most High, a minister, not perfect, but I'm perfectly willing. I've been given a delegated authority. I have tremendous power available to me. It's dynamic and it's working. I've abused this authority, take advantage of it in the wrong way with my wife's and relationships with people, places and things, and I've abused that authority. Say that. I've abused that authority. I ask forgiveness for abusing that authority. Regardless, right now, Lord, I take my rightful place uh, uh, over my family that's out there today, my wife, my kids. Uh, I take authority over myself. I lift up holy hands. I look straight up into heaven to my perpetual priest and I intercede I stand in the gap based upon that third and I look to Jesus the author and perfecter of my faith who endured the cross for my sake so today everybody lift up holy hands Lord we take authority in Jesus name over that adder in the hole here we take Authority over that Jezebel spirit that's been out to castrate humbly with repentant hearts. We humbly come in respect with that delegated authority. No one, it's not us, it's your authority, Lord. We, we receive that authority and we pronounce it. We wave our palm branches today and we declare and announce the new king has come. He's here. God has taken Christ's sense of church, Liberty Lodge, to a new level. And we stand against all your schemes, plans, and attacks, devil. Uh, God has given us strategies, and we're going to stand up, and we're going to war against you. And today, we declare. Today, we take authority. Today, we proclaim. We announce the favorable year of the Lord. Now, I want all you ladies to open your hands. All right, men. Let's bless these ladies, okay? Y'all extend your hands out and... I don't know whether you're single or whatever, but we pray our covering right now. Extend them hands out, man. Our holy, we're going to cover you right now. We're going to wash you right now with the Word of God. We're taking authority over uh, you not to tolerate you, but to understand you. 
We pray over the war room and the ladies and the authority in the place, and we give back to them for giving so much to us, and we, we anoint our, our ladies. Some of you, your wives are back home, or your moms, uh, that's included here right now, so we're, we're blessing all the women, all the women in your life right now, we're blessing them. We're calling down favor. We're invoking supernatural blessings to guard their minds, to guard their hearts, to bless them financially, physically. For those that are single, I pray you'll supernaturally raise up a godly man that will lead them and do for them and, and complete that. In the meantime, we beat that devil off of them. We pray against that spirit of confusion, that spirit of castration. And we take authority over this church. And all God's people said, it's done. Everybody say, it's done. Okay, game's on now, all right? War's on, all right? We ready to go to war? All right, let's go back and let's all stand and uh, let's uh, spend some time. I tell you what, let's, uh, let's just skip to that last song, okay? I want everybody to just stay standing. Let's, let's uh, grab your palm branches now, okay? We're free. Uh, walk him. Oh, my God. Okay, let's, let's end with this song, okay? Let's wave our palm branch and declare what God has given to us today, amen?